Okay. Welcome everybody to Bayesian Stats. We're going to continue with our lecture on MCMC, so the most important algorithm of all time. Is that true? Is that, is that a real thing? Number one algorithm of the last century. Speak up a little bit. Number one, Metropolis. Metropolis, yeah. I don't know if it is the same on this one or not. Yeah, is it like, well, okay, so I'm going to show you something even a slot, slightly bit better. <laughs> so, the async variant. That is what I'm going to show you. Uh, my code is actually implementing a more generalized version of it, but it's all Metropolis ASIC. So, let me say this every MCMC algorithm in the world is Metropolis ASIC. I don't care what anybody says. So, it is. We'll show it to you. Everything we're uh, discussing is just alternatives to proposal strategies. Um, we'll talk about that. I'll try to give you a more thorough version that's in my previous lectures for this class. So I think we're ramping up the computational side in this version of the class. Um, best algorithm in the world? It's 10 top algorithms. Anybody think that that list should be reorganized or something else introduced into it? You guys don't have a favorite algorithm? Are you kidding? Do you have a favorite theorem? Um, those of you that have taken the oral exam from me, I ask you those questions. To tell me, and then I ask you to choose and explain it to me. So what it is. If you do not have a favorite algorithm or a favorite theorem, get one. So do you have a favorite song? Favorite color? Eric, what's your favorite color? My favorite one. Your favorite color? Uh, uh, Olga, what's your favorite color? Green. Green. That's my favorite color, too. So, I like green. Um, any other favorite colors? Green's the best color, right? No, uh -huh. purple. Purple. Yes, Adam. That's kind of funny. So, Olga's wearing purple, then Adam's wearing <laughs> green. So, we still like other colors sometimes. Um, I'm a little bit monochrome these days, but I like green. So, um, there's no best. That is a, like, we do this all the time. It's the best thing. It depends. So, my favorite color really depends on the day, time of year. You know, I don't know. I get kind of a, a warm feeling about blue sometimes. So, I sometimes like blue a lot. <laughs> so, the point is, is that when we say something is the best, it depends. And so we're going to be saying this a lot throughout this class as we start aiming for objectivity that matters. Stephen, what's your favorite guitar? Is that a hard question? Yeah. It's an impossible thing, isn't it? The point is that there's no answer to these questions. So, uh, on the spot is hard too. So, anyway, um, we're going to be talking about objectivity throughout the remainder of this class. Um, algorithms are pretty cool, though, and I'm going to be showing you a very important algorithm of the last hundred years or forever, however you want to think about it. Um, there may be variants that are more modern, but it's all the same thing, kind of. Same theory, but notice um, homework three is out. I'll walk you through that in a second. And uh, no review tomorrow. So tomorrow is a very important day in my life, so I'm going to enjoy it. So it don't happen too often. So anyway, I'm going to be at home during that. But we'll be back on to review the, the following week. This is the gap between the homework due. There's one that was supposed to be due on Monday, but you have until Friday to turn it in, and a new one out. So hopefully, all your questions have been answered. If not, send it to Slack. Somebody will get you an answer. Uh, let me show you the whole. There we go. Okay, new one out. Uh, I want you to play around with the regression. So we're going to be starting to move towards kind of some general applications of Bayesian stuff. Implementation is moderate in this 
um, problem. Anything that I say don't implement, you don't have to implement it is what I really mean, and you will implement it in the future. So if you get bored, implement everything. So that's a good strategy when you see MCMC algorithms and somebody says it's good, implement it and use it on your favorite toy examples. See how it works. If you do that, for everyone that you're presented with, you will go on to fame and fortune. So, you will be a professor. <laughs> no fortune, no fame, but it will assure you of a job. So, very good things. You'll start to notice stuff that we can apply the theory in our implementation to check if stuff is right. It was supposed to do this. If it didn't do that, that's a bug. So I have people sometimes say, well, my MCMC started converging. Talk about what that all means. And then it kind of walked away from convergence for a second. Is that allowed? No. So that's a measurable step. So that's a bug. So it's probably you're by like infinity or something stupid. Martin? The question about problem one point one. When you see an XY photo slash V zero one, that is the center point of XY, right? Yeah. Okay, that's right. So that's where we're centering that thing. So X, Y, what I mean there is you're going to grab two samples, and they're both going to be these Cauchy's, some sort of joint Cauchy thing. So there is a difference right here in my notation. I wrote one, but I mean I, the identity. That's going to be a two-dimensional thing. If you generate two Cauchy's independently of each other, that doesn't follow the joint Cauchy relationship. If you generate two independent normals, everything works out just great. Cauchy's are a bit different. So what would happen if you just generated two different ones is when the Cauchy realization was far into the tail, one of them probably wouldn't be far into the tail. So you'd only be spiking the margins. So I always call that like a Cauchy shock or something. I'm not sure if that's the terminology, but we could get that one here discrete Cauchy. So I have to do samples of Cauchy's, compute mins and maxes in the last homework, and you're probably like, am I code working? Because I keep getting this big value out here, and it keeps moving. So the min and the max from a Cauchy, all of you will give me wildly different answers. So it's like giving me the mean in a Cauchy or something like that generate the mean of a Cauchy, take a whole bunch of samples, take the mean, it's really just another Cauchy that you're getting back. And it could be really big or small, negative or something else. Cauchy's are kind of funky. A lot of times they're concentrated, but then these wild behaviors. So I like Cauchy's because when people talk to me about outliers, I'm like, what do you mean by outliers? You mean that's the data that you collected and that's the most interesting data point in the whole sample and you want to get rid of it? So, yeah, they told me, pluck it off. Cook's distance is big. Get rid of that thing. So Dennis Cook says, um, throw away the data point. I'm not sure if that's what Dennis Cook says. It's my academic grandfather. So, don't know the guy. So, met him once. Um, I have a different sort of thing. If you believe that's really the stochasticity in the data, um, you model it differently. You don't cut normal airs on anything. So if you guys have read things like the Black Swan, that basically talks about the 1988 financial collapse, and that statistics and statisticians ruin the economy. Um, Caleb was a bit unfair about that. It was people on Wall Street that were manipulating statistics. So, and using Gaussian functions for everything. Who were these people? Halleck even tells you. He's like, I love when the market collapsed because I knew all this stuff we were doing was wrong. And then he places blame on somebody else other than himself. He also says in the preface of the book, he will not entertain heavy tail distributions. So in the preface of that book, The Black Swan, he had read it, it's a good statistician read. So, check these things out, it's kind of pop culture. Number one bestseller for a while. It's junk, but super entertaining. So it's not the way I know statisticians kind of act. We use heavy tail distributions. He says in the preface, we won't talk about them. And that's all you need to do. Just, if you would have said, we're going to talk about 
the guild distributions. There's nothing else to say. We should have been doing that in the beginning. That's how I think about this. So let's just entertain a quick problem, just to kind of drive home the point. Um, Say you solve data at the point this. So this is y and this is x. Somebody gave that to you and said, I want to have a trend, and you'd say, let's get a line for this. The line should do something like this. Who knows? So a lot of people do a lot of work to get that line a little bit better. So um, the two-dimensional example is not that compelling because anybody can walk up to it, draw their line. <laughs> different methods draw slightly different lines. And if the data looked like that, they would be very slightly different. So we have looked at the residuals of everything. Check these little residuals. Probably that color for that. This residual. So the distance from the line to the point, we're only measuring the y-axis. So typically in regression, we think the x's are given, they're not stochastic, and the y's are fixed. In a lot of problems, that's not true. We have uncertainty in the x's as well. As a Bayesian, that's a trivial problem. But prior on those as well, center on somewhere, probably where you saw the data and put some air into it. Treat it like a random variable. Other people do something similar, they just say it differently. Uh, if I saw data like this, and there was this one point way out here, so I could have a point way out here that's different from everything, but it's kind of in the direction of the, the line. It doesn't have a lot of leverage. What they'll say, that's that Cook's distance stuff that I'm talking about. But if I had a point way up here, it's totally different. So it's kind of anomalous in the x direction, but super anomalous in the y direction, it's going to have a lot of influence on this line if you use the wrong method. So if you're modeling errors and all of a sudden you have this big thing right here, you say, well, it's an outlier. Um, what they told me in my first regression class is throw away. Do a lot of like, massage this data set. And I've got to admit, I don't like that. Because what I want to know is, why is that point like that? And if you give it to me, it's interesting enough to look at. So let's imagine, let's give these some context. In the presence of y and x, I can't tell what to do with that point. Because it's just y and x. I haven't told you anything about the problem. But let's say this is like um, sales prices, or say ticket sales. And I'll put this in dollars. Um, for a movie. So some movie right here. So this is like, um, let me give you this axis as well. This is going to be ticket prices. Sales is what I mean. How much did it actually sell for a movie? So each point is the same movie, but this is going to be domestically. And this is going to be international. We all know something about movies, so now I can start thinking about things. It's like, tell me what movie this is. So this one didn't sell very much. Right here, right on the line. Doesn't steer anything too much. Looks like it's right in line with the trend. And it's just not a well Seen movie. So give me an example. What movie is that? So, the movie that nobody heard of. Give me an example. We don't talk about it. It's not interesting. So nobody knows that movie because we're gonna watch it. What about this? What's this movie? It's like Titanic. So Titanic. You guys watched it. I know you did. How do I know it? Because it's sold a lot. Everybody's seen it. I mean, you not seen it before? Unbelievable. <laughs> so, how many people have not seen Titanic? Okay, of three people. 
So it's one of those movies that kind of everybody saw. A lot of people did. Have you seen Star Wars? I got up three years ago. So. Oh, you, have you watched the latest one? I haven't. Okay. So then your vote is excluded. So I'm going to just rip it out of this because I don't like that you don't watch Star Wars. So he's almost caught. You won't tell what happened. But it depends on the problem at hand. Do we keep that point in there or not? If this was money in the stock market and something was going on, I'd say we certainly need to analyze that thing. That's telling you a broad change. For movie prices, it's, it's kind of interesting. I would kind of want to know about that. that this thing happens sometimes. So a lot of people will get rid of that and say it's all calcium. And I don't want to do that. I want to leave the point in there. And I don't want my regression line to do this. So what it might do, because it's got a lot of influence on the line, and that would be because of the normal assumption that you put into things. So this problem will steer you through how to do a Cauchy regression. So we can do the whole Bayesian thing that inclines us to be a bit computational. And we can also add little layers to our Bayesian code. So we're going to learn about give sampling eventually, and there are little blocks of samplers. And so you can start updating latent variables, something like that, something that maybe is this influence on creating the random variable. We could even or giving the output that's off the line, it's that big residual outline um, thing. We can give funny names to our random effects or our um, whatever is confounding everything, we can model it, essentially. So this problem right here, we'll have you play around with some regressions. And if you do the wrong thing and you get the wrong model, you can get bad at it. Um, this class is not about ripping out outliers. It's about asking questions about the context of the problem, figure out what we do. So I want you to generate some data. So this is going to be the identity matrix right here, and this is centered at zero. Thanks for the clarification. And I want some correlation structure to this. Whatever we call that, I'm not sure if that's correlation. It's certainly a rotation. But I want to scale it by this. I can't say correlation because there's no variances in this problem. Because it's Cauchy. So I need a new word. So I'm going to say that's my scale matrix. So in a normal regression, I would call that sigma. And I would call it sigma in the Cauchy regression as well. So if you don't know how to generate bivariate Cauchy's that are independent of each other, you need to think a little bit about it before you do things that you normally do with normality. If you have a bivariate Cauchy generator, just plug in zero and I, and boom, it'll give you doubles and everything. It's definitely different than generating two univariate Cauchy's. Why? Because two univariate Cauchy's are usually going to spike only in the axis directions x and y at once. It's unlikely that you would see it spike at the same time. We've got correlation in this problem, so they need to be able to spike in the diagonal directions. And so if you generate two independent Cauchy's and you multiply by the Cholesky factor of that, if you don't know what that is, look it up. So it's basically the square root of a matrix in some sense. They're not unique. There's a lot of ways to do it. Um, Cholesky factors exist if and only if the uh, matrix is positive definite. Turns out the Cholesky factorization, if you took numerics class, is the fastest way that you can check if a matrix is positive definite. So when you use some of like R's built in functions or MATLAB's built in functions, they usually check before everything. And it'll slow down your code. So sometimes you want to rewrite your code. Make sure what you're passing in is valid. That's certainly positive definite right there. Um, with normal data, what you would do is you would take normal 0, 1 data, you would get two different draws independently, and you'd multiply by the Cholesky factor, and it would rotate everything. It would have that correlation structure. Um, we can talk about that in a review session. So that would be a good question to bring up how you do this, and I've done the details. Um, with Cauchy, if you do that, it won't work. Because only one of those margins is going to be shocking or spiking at a time. So you need to do it jointly. I'll let you think about it a little bit. 
Um, just a heads up, T1s are Cauchy, so if you've got a T sampler, you've got a Cauchy sampler. But I want you to think about these issues. How does it work in a computer? And this code that you're going to develop will help you answer the question. Um, I can decompose normals in GAMs and get Cauchy's. That's the big thing here. So you're going to generate this Cauchy cloud. It's going to look something like that picture I generated. Every once in a while, there's going to be a value that's very different from everything else with the same sort of structure. Kind of elongated that way, it kind of wants to jump off in that direction a little bit more. Koshis have so much variability, you probably can't tell. It probably just looks sporadic and all over the place. Um, if you fit a Bayesian regression, so here's kind of a Bayesian analysis. I say beta is distributed like this, but in the context of the problem, it's got the x's and the y's. So this is beta x, y. This is the Bayesian analysis, and you come up with this already. So that's what you might do to get your beta. You've got a full distribution on it. You've got a full distribution on that line that you fitted. Bayesian want to think that way. That's kind of nice. Uh, you can do predictive analysis. I get these samples. And I can sample directly from this. Does anybody know how to sample from a normal distribution? How's it done? We push the button on our computer and it gives us a sample. Anybody know what your computer does? Think about it. There's something going on there. So this is what a Monte Carlo class will teach you about. Teach you more about that. I can tell you all about it in the review session. So it's called the box mirror algorithm. It's probably the implementation that everybody uses. It transforms uniforms into normals. For the price of two uniforms, I'll give you two normals. Um, this regression right here, the bottom one, we can do that same sort of thing where instead of taking sigma squared, I divide by gamma, and I let that gamma have some distribution. For some numbers A and B, that's Cauchy. Okay? I've got a lot of flexibility for it. Turns out if it's mu over 2, mu over 2, that's going to be a T with degrees of freedom. New. New is that little deep that maybe you should use. For one half, one half, it's Cauchy. So math is always the same on this. So it doesn't matter if I'm working in high dimension. This thing's still a scalar. That's now a Cauchy random variable. It doesn't matter. You prove that on a couple. Get used to doing that in the world. It's the same in roll every single time. And you divide by that beta term in there. Think about how to do it in high deep. That's what's coming next. Um, this is saying this whole bed here, right here, has some sort of Cauchy distribution. You might be inclined to do that to make everything Cauchy, but it's not the right thing to do. Turns out every point is generated is a Cauchy. That would be a little bit different. This problem walks you through how to do that in general. In general. So what you want to think about is the forward model and the normal centered in Xi transpose beta, so that's just some of the Xi beta, so it's a little bit different. Uh, I like to make everything a column vector. It's very typical. I could have made this a row vector, and sometimes you'll see folks do that. I don't like to mix. It's like, all my vectors are going like this. So, like some people. So standard regression, but for every one of these points, I'm going to generate a gamma half half, and I'm going to turn this into a Cauchy realization. Like your speech jump around in a Cauchy fashion. So kind of like what we've seen already. My other problem, I have the X's jumping around as well. And those are all a little bit different. But if you had some process like this, then you could fit this sort of Cauchy Gigan data. And so how do you do it? These steps walk you through the full conditional calculations that to be able to do to run an efficient metropolis Hastings within GIF sampling. We'll be talking about that. I think you don't even need metropolis Hastings, in fact. Everything will be conjugate. So it turns out it's really simple. I'm going to be walking you through GIF sampling in the next couple of days. But the full conditionals are still just the full conditionals like we've been talking about. As promised, we use them all the time. Uh, so I want a full conditional for beta in this problem. I want a full conditional for sigma, and I need a full conditional for each of the gamma highs. There's a different gamma high for each gamma point. 
So you've got to update a bunch of stuff. You run that in a loop that's called a give sampler. If you sample from them, we'll be going through the theory and implementation of that. But all I want you to do in this problem is write down full conditionals. So if you have n data points, you have n full conditionals for this, and they all kind of look about the same. You've got a full conditional for beta, and you've got a full conditional for sigma squared. If you're like me, you'll change sigma squared into a feed. Use the reference prior in your full conditional will be a gamma. Full conditional for the beta will be a normal. The full conditionals for the gammas are going to be aptly described by a gamma distribution. So big question in this is what's the prior? It turns out you don't even have to think about it. There's no choice for you to make here. I'll let you think about that a little bit more. Think about how you generated the data. Use that same process, and you do well. So if you use a different process to infer than you use to, to produce the data, you do worse. That's days off of that. In a nutshell. Um, full conditionals, here's some basic linear algebra problems I want you to take a whack at. So you've done this in your first linear algebra class, so just remind yourself what the trace is of a matrix and how all this stuff works right here. Basically, you can spin these little matrices around right here, and it turns out the trace of any cyclic permutation, so you can't permute them in any way. So you have to roll them from the front to the back. If you do them in a cycle like that, all the traces are equivalent to each other. We'll use that in a couple of days. So brush up on that. Um, I'll describe a problem to you, an actual scientific problem, concerning some rats and their weights and a longitudinal analysis. This was um, described in the first big sampling paper. I'll walk you through that paper. But all this says is write down the whole conditional for all the parameters. So step one, write down the likelihood. If you get that wrong, you don't have a chance. So being able to write down likelihood you're being placed on here. You'll derive the full conditionals. Later on, I'll have you do the sampling of those full conditionals. Um, and you'll see if you get the same results as Gelfand and Smith and their colleagues that were um, actual scientists measuring rat weights. I guess that's a pretty common problem. Do something to a rat, see what happens to it. Sorry. <laughs> so, I work in those fields. Uh, Give sampling for metropolis. I want you to do two different things. So this is the problem we've been studying in class. I'm just going to give you a mu and a b. Usually I don't give them to you. I say, pick your own. Just make sure it all works. Uh, I'll give them to you in this problem. Uh, under reference priors, what did I just say? You use the prior one over b and the uh, uh, black prior. So use those priors. That's what I'm telling you to do. That's the language that I usually speak in. So standard reference analysis, I usually say that in papers. People go, oh, it's standard. I don't need to ask anything about it. They should ask. So and when people do, I describe it more in a paper, and I show them some other choices. Um, I want you to update these in a block. So you're going to basically be implementing the metropolis Hastings algorithm. You're going to propose something, and you're going to decide to accept it. We're not there yet. I'll be giving you this algorithm shortly. Um, and then I want you to implement the Gibbs sample and compare against it. So this is the way to do this problem right here. We may get to the tab. I haven't given a due date on this homework. Let me look at the calendar and see what I think is reasonable. I think I'm going to move to Friday due dates. I'm going to make sure the review session is going to get better. Um, there's some other little reference analyses in here. This might be a bit long, but just know all these problems are coming in. Sierra is going to give you a lecture soon on Jeffrey's problems. So we know kind of the foundations of Bayes, now we can get into it. Okay, that's your homework. Lots to talk about there, lots to think about, lots of implementation, and lots of deriving things as well. So computational lists are always good to math. Do the math so you can code up the wrong thing. Sometimes I have things coded up and I'm like, I coded it up right. I have an error in my math. Put it up the wrong thing. I've just been convinced that wasn't it. So we need to be able to melt those skills. We'll beat all the computer scientists if you can do that. That's where computer science needs to go, and statistics needs to go the way of implementation. So lots of good things happen at that intersection. 
OK。Let's just go back for a second here to the problem that we are studying. I want to show you a couple things. So this is what we ran last time. This is the exact same data. There's our two-dimensional trace plot that's forming and showing you where the samples are, the lines are connecting where the previous sample was. So I'm kind of showing you the Markov time step in there as well. Each sample only depends on the previous sample. That's the Markov property. There's all my samples right there. Um, and I've got the margins as well. And what I've done is I've ended up plotting all the iterations for phi across all those iterations I did. That thing right there is called the trace plot. Okay? Most people look at them in one dimension. They're supposed to be like nice, fuzzy caterpillars. Okay? You'll see some different ones in a second. I'm going to change my implementation a little bit. And the margins represent the marginal distribution. So those are the integrated things. So one of them is a T, one of them is a gamma. And you derive both of those in your homeworks. Um, let's go under the hood a little bit. Now, it's certainly possible for you to go back to the video and go, I'm going to get Lehman's implementation and write it exactly that way. That will do you two disservices. You won't have the ability to learn. And my implementation is designed to be slow so that I can show things to you. So there's many problems with this. If you like looking at people's code, that's cool. Uh, I've got some initializers in all of this. So my first step depended on an initial value, just like most iterative algorithms. I guess they all consider it. Gotta start somewhere. Um, so I have some values plugged in right there. So I ended up initializing everything at whatever these values were. Mu in it, true mu, true sigma. I cheated. So I put in the truth. Of course it works great. So I started it at the truth. While the truth is at the center of my distribution, that would probably be a slightly better place. It's in the distribution. It's the distribution is overlapping the truth is supposed to. So it turns out this algorithm is actually trying to move towards the truth, where the truth is the distribution, sampling from that posterior. And I started it there. That's the thing we never know in the first place. So we need to be a little bit more dramatic and show what happens if I change this value. So I think the truth, I don't remember what I picked. Does anybody remember? You know, like 102, okay, 102, something like that. So let's start it kind of far away. Let's make this minus 100. So it's kind of in the other half of the quadrant over there. And let's make this 5. We'll get rid of that. So I've got some initializers. And you will too. You probably put them in the argument function. Let's start it somewhere. So good algorithms are supposed to run when you start at the wrong place. See how it works. This doesn't look great. Do you use a sigma not That's why you start it. So I want you to kind of look at this. Yeah, exactly. Here. Synapses are firing, figuring out what's going on. So it took a lot for a while. And so it started at the wrong place, and it kind of moved into the right place, right here. So it walked down this axis, then it walked across until it found this thing. And once it found it, it stayed there. That's called stationary. Just to give you some words. The process is limiting to something. When it gets there, it stays there. It stays in the stationary distribution. If everything is implemented right, and gamma radiation doesn't affect my computer adversely, sometimes you get weird things that happen. Blank about this cosmic stuff. It's always my implementation in them. Uh, but eventually it worked. Now, when I go and give everybody these samples, right here, there's a sample for my distribution. Now, this stuff is junk. This is called a burn-in period. 
of everything. We want to rip it out. So it's the samples before the distribution gets stationary. So we have some concepts and we can see the algorithm kind of working through it. So I don't want to show this distribution. So if somebody said, what's new? And I show them that, what I'm showing them is an artifact of my algorithm. It's something we need to toss. So these aren't good artifacts right here. So we need to chop that off. So what we want to do is get rid of this portion right here. We'll notice that in our two different marginal distributions, these converged at different times. So you can see it in this picture that all of a sudden this thing came down first, and then it took an additional number of steps to get over here. So you can see the trajectory of this thing. So one of those parameters is converging to its margin faster but those two margins are entangled. So if one thing doesn't converge, don't think anything else is converged. So if the parameters, of course, are independent in the model, some things could converge while others might not. But if they're all tangled up like here, not independent, you need them both to converge. This is not the marginal distribution. That one's not. This looks like it's stationary. That's looking like it's gone stationary. Um, we probably want to check this a couple more times with different values and see what it does. My co code is fairly robust. There's things that I've done so I can start very far from the truth and it still works. Saying that, if I plug things like b to the minus into my computer, this code would not work. So if I had a b to the minus calculation in there, it would have exploded at some point. So never write that into code. So we work on log scale. So I'll be walking you through those details soon enough. You'll be doing it on your samplers. This is usually what soaks up most people's time. It's not the interesting part, but it's the part that keeps other people away from our jobs. They don't want to do it. They don't have the patience. Okay, so I've got an argument in my code. There's a few arguments, then in steps, I will talk about that later. So, it's not theoretically interesting. It's something people do for implementation reasons. But my burn-in, I said, well, I'm going to start burning it in, and I'll take it at the first sample. So I have a little toggle in there. And all it does is it just shades off the front of the vectors that I'm storing everything in. And so I'm going to say this is, how big should I make it? Kind of look at this right here. Let me see. What I'll do is I'll stare at my trace plots and I'll go, that took a lot of iterations to get there. So I'm going to try to run it again and see if it comes up with the same answer. And I'm going to start it way over here. So this is like 500,000. I can't count the zeros through this screen. So I'm going to shave one off, turn that into a five. So I'm going to grab about half of them. So on paper, they're always like, how long did you run it for? What was your burn-in period? And in the early 90s, that was like the thing to ask. And I tend to think it was pretty silly in the early 2000s when everybody's like, how many steps did it take? And how many, I was like, I've never heard a talk in the world where somebody ran a Newton Rapson, a maximizing thing, some sort of quasi-Newton method. And everybody says, how many steps and how many and blah, 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 if you have to do anything like fancy in it. They're really boring details, but what you do want to show people when you run this is you have thought about everything, you've diagnosed it, you know it's converging. And so I have some sentences and citations that I add when I say I did these things. So I always do lots right here to check everything. Sierra can attest, it's never good enough. She runs her thing, how do you know it's right? How do you know what you're showing it? Because I, I don't love looking at plots with errors in them. <laughs> Burn a lot of brain power. Dot plot going, oh, it gets this, and then it's up there, it's a bug. So she's building up an artillery of validation methods. And I always ask her, did you check these things? Did you do this? Yeah, of course I did. It works great. She might tell me something and I feel less assured. Now we can talk about the plots. Okay, so this is the life that you get into when you're an MCMC or anything computational. 
So I'm going to throw in the burn in period for rebuilds. Now you might say, why not just start from the stationary region since you knew where it went? That's fair game. And once you know, you can start there. But you really want to stretch your code and make sure you're finding the right thing. So running MCMC is doing it over and over and over again. I ripped off the burn-in period. Looked like it burned in quite a bit faster this time if you look at those plots. Also, I got rid of all that stuff. So my burn-in was the middle, where there's a five on the screen. It's times 10 to the fifth, if you don't see that. Um, and so I'm way in there. And so I threw everything away, I discarded it, and then I drew my histograms. So my histograms are drawn from this stuff right here. This stuff. That's what's going on here. Here's my joint samples. So burning, you just write down a term for you. Burning is the time, the number of iterations very unimaginatively call that the time. Okay, why? Because everything takes a fixed number of time at every step. So the time, the number of iterations until the process is stationary. go back and understand these terms mathematically. They all mean something. So, but I think we understand it visually so that we can think about the picture while we develop the map. The process of limiting distribution, um, what it limits to, oftentimes are the exact same things. If a limiting distribution exists, it is the stationary distribution. So our algorithm is marching through a Markov chain. That's what's happening under the hood. I'll tell you about that Markov chain in a moment. That's the metropolis species process. Um, and if you march through the process for an infinite number of times under some conditions, it will limit to the same distribution every time, regardless of your starting point. And if it always comes back to the same place every single time, it's stationary. Sometimes limiting processes do not exist. It winds up somewhere else and it gets trapped. So under three conditions, limiting distributions are stationary, and those three conditions are true for the algorithm. I'll be telling you about this. So I think before we get into anything, we need a little bit of terminology. So this is a full-blown class on Markov processes, but certainly somebody that does Markov chain Monte Carlo is an expert at it, or they should be. Most people that do it, they just lift the algorithm off the shelf Use them, but I think if you're going to develop algorithms, you really have to understand what the theory is. So we're going to go a little bit deep into it. So a Markov process. It's a process that only depends on the past. It's immediate past. So let me write this down. S T given X T minus one all the way to the first starting point. Sometimes I use zero, sometimes I use one. There's nothing fancy when I'm switching. So why do I do one over the other? So we'll go back to the first time step. So each of these indices right here, the step in the process, I'm referring to as a step in time. It's pretty common language. So this right here is going to be equal to, so this is a process, this is a random variable. This is what I've seen in the past. 
So that random variable, depending on the past, is equal to xt given xt minus 1. So they're equivalent to each other. So what's 3 equal something? The 3 thing hey, defined. It's a definition. It is this. Not setting up an equation. Saying that it's a fact. That's what it is. So a Markov process has this problem. That's all I have to tell you. I tell you this, it's Markov. It only depends on its past through its immediate predecessor. So any process that does this is Markov. So here's an example. I'll say xt is equal to alpha plus beta xt minus 1 plus here. And I'll make the errors real easy. 0 sigma squared. So they're normally distributed. I could change that and it would Cauchy by adding that little gamma thing into it. So if I add code that implemented this, every time I saw that sigma squared, I generate by a divide by a gamma. It's maybe changing. I can change my implementations. This is called an autoregressive one model. Sometimes people call it AR1. They're not aggressive. So it just means the future is determined by the past, and then there's some equations. Now, this process is sometimes stationary. Sometimes this will drift off to infinity, this process, and it never arrives at a distribution. If you try to analyze non-stationary data with a stationary process, Once you spend a couple days doing this, come back and I'll try to like the smart off one of these. And we'll have a conversation. We'll never infer anything non-stationary with the stationary model. Change points are usually where people might go breaking up the space, finding stationary regions. Um, it's autoregressive one because it only depends on one pass. Autoregressive two neighbors get re or models get regressed on two previous neighbors. Those are not Markovi. Okay. If the air was getting regressed on a past residual or something like that, then we call it a moving average model. When you combine the two things, there are part of models. It's time series model one. There's set models for one point. I'll have some more problems using those. They're just like regression models because it's regression. Uh, okay. Markov chains exploit this problem. So I'm just going to show you the Markov chain real quick. So here's just an example. Two by two, Markov chain. I'll say this is P11, P12, P21, P22. PIJs is a transition probability. a special word called probability. Probabilities live between 0 and 1, so it tells you those elements live between 0 and 1. And this is a transition between state 1, state i, and state j. So if you want me to enumerate the states, do this. So this probability right here is the probability from going from state 1 and staying in state 1. This right here is the probability of going from state 1 and moving to state 2. And so these things right here have to sum to 1 if there's just two states. So if this is a probability space, I've got a probability assigned to everywhere it can go. So two state model. Very generic, very simple. These are the probabilities of starting in state two and moving either to one or to two. And so if those are all non-zero numbers, I can move from anywhere to anywhere in one step. And it mixes very nicely. Turns out 
This would induce a limiting distribution because it mixes nicely. You can get from anywhere to anywhere. You can return back in a finite amount of time if those are all non-zero. And I don't have any funny patterns that form the Markov chain. We'll talk about those three things. I need to give you some more math. But I want you to understand it is if the chain can kind of move from any state to any state without anything funny happening, no weird patterns form, it's really random, it's not deterministic in the middle somehow, then it turns out Markov chains will have limiting distributions which are stationary. Um, Markov chain Monte Carlo is a Monte Carlo process that's Markovian. So it moves through everything in a Markovian fashion. Next time, I think it would be a good thing to rewrite all these down a little bit more mathematical, but if you want to look it up on Wikipedia, definitely be my guess what these things are. Um, Markov chains can be continuous or they can be discrete. So in our example that we're looking at with the mu's and the phi's, we're moving through a continuous state space. When I enumerate everything using a matrix, everything is discrete state space because I can say that's the bin that everything goes into, and I can write it down as a matrix. I'm going to stick with a lot of my notation using Markov transition matrices, because the math is a little bit easier to write down, but the exact same concepts apply in continuous space. So if you'd like to think, oh, this is a matrix that I'm bidding everything up infinitely fine, and giving an infinite number of categories, it's like that. So that's what continuums are. Saying that, if you don't like to think about continuums and you argue that everything is discrete, that's okay too. Just have a fun talking to people that believe in continuity. So uh, it also makes the math easier when you can do calculus and you don't just have to do that. So I'm going to tell you what stationarity is for a matrix and what limiting distributions are next time. And I'll describe them using an example of that. And then I'll move on. Then, Yes, we'll have a lot of details to talk about for a couple of days. So, after that, Sierra's going to walk you through Jeffrey's problems. She's going to have a lecture for you that she's going to be tailoring. So we expect awesome news on Jeffrey's problems. She'll do the math. Hey, thanks so much.